Situated on the western edge of Russia, Kursk is a bustling industrial city featuring a stunning cathedral in its center. But don't be fooled, Kursk isn't just any other Russian city. In fact, its history is one of global significance. Nearly 80 years ago, it was home to one of the largest battles the world has ever seen. A battle so intense, it changed the tide of the eastern front of the Second World War and paved the way for the Red Army to march all the way to Berlin. This is the legendary Battle of Kursk. In 1941, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union. After months of fighting, his forces had taken huge chunks of Soviet territory, including Ukraine, the Baltics, Belarus, and pushing the Red Army all the way back to the edges of Moscow. But despite the initial success, Operation Barbarossa didn't achieve its main goals. After all, the Soviet Union was still standing and still putting up a fierce fight. The front line between the two powers now stretched north to south, down the edge of Western Russia. In early 1943, after one of the bloodiest battles in human history, the Soviet Union finally pushed the Germans away from Stalingrad and just a few weeks later launched another counterattack, liberating the cities of Kharkov, Belgorod, and Kursk. This was an exciting victory, but the Soviets had suffered immense casualties in these battles and had started to overextend their forces, and the Germans struck back at their first chance. These battles could be entire videos on their own, but to put it very briefly, after intense tank and infantry battles in the cities and non-stop bombing runs from the sky, the Germans successfully recaptured two of the cities, Kharkov and Belgorod, leaving the remaining Soviet forces to retreat back to Kursk. But the Germans didn't take back all the land they had lost during the Soviet counterattacks, and just to the west of Kursk was a salient, or bulge, that the Soviet Union had punched into the front line. And it was massive, stretching 150 miles from north to south and protruding nearly 100 miles westward into the Nazi front line. This bump in the front line gave the Soviets some breathing room at Kursk and could potentially be used to launch another counterattack, making it the highest priority target on the Eastern Front. On March 13, 1943, Hitler signed an order authorizing the attack on the Kursk salients, but the muddy ground and exhausted troops meant that it would have to wait a few weeks. A month later, he issued a second order for the attack to commence, stating that it needed to begin no later than early May. For the Germans, it was crucial to capitalize on their momentum and strike before the Soviets fortified Kursk too heavily. The attack was codenamed Operation Citadel. The plan was centered around performing a double envelopment attack. Two teams would attack the shoulders of the salient, or the corners where it meets the straight front line. One team would start at the south and the other at the north, meeting at Kursk in the middle and effectively cutting off supply routes to the armies in the bulge like a tourniquet. The Germans had used a similar tactic in their invasion of the Soviet Union with staggering success, having encircled thousands of Soviet troops and besieged them until their surrender or their annihilation. Taking Kursk was clearly their best bet for not only deciding the next uppercut to the USSR, but also regaining the momentum in the war that had dwindled in the past few months. That's a pretty simple plan on paper, but in reality, things were a lot more complicated. General Myrtle, who was in charge of the group that was planning to strike from the north, reported to Hitler that he was having second thoughts about going through with the attack. For the last couple of weeks, his scouts had been reporting that Kursk appeared to be beefing up its defenses, preparing for the upcoming battle. In light of this news, Hitler called his senior officers to Munich on May the 4th, and together they argued over whether or not Operation Citadel would be worth it or even possible. For example, Field Marshal Manstein, who was one of the major planners of the operation stated that it would only be possible if he could receive two additional infantry divisions, but Hitler told him that none were available. General Guderian was concerned that the attack would wear down the panzer divisions that he was trying to strengthen, and later said to Hitler, Is it really necessary to attack Kursk, and indeed in the East this year at all? Do you think anyone even knows where Kursk is? The entire world doesn't care if we capture Kursk or not. Hitler agreed with him and responded, I know, the thought of it turns my stomach. 
Other generals argued that the manpower and supplies that could be used at Kursk should be saved for an expected Allied attack in Western or Southern Europe, and spoiler alert, such an attack was indeed on its way. Despite the meeting ending with no official consensus on the matter, Hitler decided to go through with Operation Citadel. He believed that even though the Soviets were fortifying their defenses and amassing huge numbers of tanks, newer and more advanced German weaponry would be the key to victory. This included the powerful elephant tank destroyer and the new Panther tank. The operation began to resemble an arms race as Hitler, after receiving reports of even more Soviet reinforcements, would delay the attack to strengthen his own forces, giving the Soviets even more time to build up their defenses. This continued for two months, with each side growing stronger and stronger. Stalin had been aware of the impending Nazi attack for months, thanks to the spy network Lucy that was operating out of Switzerland, leaking German intelligence to the Allies. Initially, Stalin wanted to attack first and strike before the Germans could consolidate their forces, but his generals convinced him that a defensive strategy was a better option. General Zhukov, for example, argued that defending Kursk would be the perfect place to lure the bulk of the German armor into a destructive trap. He reasoned that it would be better to make the enemy exhaust himself against our defenses and knock out his tanks and then bringing up fresh reserves to go over to the general offensive which would finally finish off his main force soldiers and over 300,000 hired civilians worked around the clock transforming kursk into a fortress on both the northern and southern faces of the kursk bulge were three main rows of defense these included machine gun bunkers barbed wire anti-tank ditches artillery and mines lots of mines around kursk concentrated mostly on the first defensive lines of the northern and southern faces the soviets planted more than 500,000 anti-tank mines and almost 450,000 anti-personnel mines placed along the most likely german routes were hundreds of anti-tank strongholds each consisting of several anti-tank guns even more anti-tank rifles several heavy machine guns and infantry armed with grenades and automatic weapons movement between bunkers was made possible through thousands of miles of interconnecting trenches that were dug throughout the salient to mentally prepare the Soviet infantry for the anti-tank combat and to rid them of their tank phobia, soldiers had to go through a mandatory training known as ironing. After being packed into a trench like sardines, tanks were driven over the heads of the men until they got used to the giant machines bearing down on them. Soldiers were trained to separate the tanks from enemy infantry, which would leave the tank sitting dark once the men were at point-blank range with it. There was also a bit of an incentive to destroy German tanks, as the government pledged to pay a man a thousand rubles for each tank he destroyed. But perhaps the Soviets' most effective preparation was their practice of maskerovka, or deception. Camps and vehicles were camouflaged, ammunition depots were hidden, and command posts were disguised. Dummy airfields were constructed, which the Germans reportedly bombed, and false rumors were spread throughout the population of the German-held air areas around Kursk. This was also effective that by late June 1943, the Germans estimated that the Soviets had placed around 1,500 tanks in or near Kursk, while in reality, uh, there were three times this number ready for action. Not only were the Soviets hard at work at Kursk, they were also doing their part behind enemy lines. Soviet partisan groups or resistance fighters wreaked havoc in Nazi-occupied regions by inflicting serious damage to German supply routes, destroying dozens of bridges, over a thousand rail cars, almost 300 locomotives, and constantly damaging railroads. All of this slowed down the German preparations, buying precious time to gather strength at Kursk. Finally, after two months of postponing, Hitler decided that his army was ready. The German forces for the offensive consisted of about 780,000 men and just under 3,000 tanks, as well as artillery and air support. The Soviets, on the other hand, had built up around 2 million soldiers and more than 5,000 tanks. And in July 1943, these colossal armies finally came face to face with each other. On the evening of July the 4th, the first fighting of Operation Citadel began. On the southern face, the battle began with an artillery barrage and bombing runs, followed by infantry attacks on the first line of defense to gain strategic high ground for future artillery spotting. Before midnight, two villages, Petovo and Gertsovka, were captured by the Großdeutschland Panzer Grenadier Division and the 3rd and 11th Panzer Divisions. But the villagers didn't go down without a fight, and intense Soviet resistance ensured that these groups suffered heavy casualties, especially from anti-tank mines. German 
German armor broke through the first line of defense in several places on the southern front, but was stopped short of the second line. At 2 a.m. on July 5, anticipating an attack on the northern face and another push on the southern, Soviet General Zhukov ordered a massive artillery strike on the German front line. This had been planned long in advance, ever since the dates of the impending attack had been leaked to the Soviets. Zhukov hoped that this preemptive bombardment would destroy huge amounts of the gathering German forces that had been drawn in and disorganized their armies. For an entire hour, hundreds of self-propelled artillery, mortar, and mobile Kashyushka rockets fired at suspected enemy locations lighting up the horizon with explosions. After the artillery strike ended, the Germans responded with their own, pounding the northern face for 80 minutes and the southern for 50. At the ends of the bombardments, both sides had suffered minimal casualties. Firing the artillery in the dark had made it difficult to make corrective adjustments, and many of the shells simply missed their targets. After the artillery, the German army on the northern face began its advance, but the Soviets were prepared to meet them. Seemingly impenetrable defenses and dense minefields slowed the Germans to a crawl, and the Soviets fought fiercely along the whole front. Later that day, a captured Soviet soldier was interrogated and revealed a weak point on the Soviet front line, a wound in the formations caused by the German artillery. Wasting no time, the Germans deployed their Tiger tanks to exploit the weakness, and the Soviets brought in 90 T-34s to defend it. After three hours of battle, 40 Soviet tanks had been destroyed, while on the German side, two Tigers had been destroyed and five had been mobilized. It was a serious loss to the Soviets in terms of numbers, but the fight had brought them time to patch up the weakness in their front line. Overall, the first day resulted in the Germans capturing a measly 10 kilometers or 6 miles of territory. Much of this was due to the effectiveness of the Soviet minefields, who dealt serious damage to German armor on the first day. For example, the 653rd Heavy Panzerjäger Battalion sent in 45 Ferdinand tank destroyers, and all but 12 were destroyed or immobilized by mines. Many of these were able to be recovered and repaired, but obviously at a cost of both time. And material. On the next day, July the 6th, the Soviets launched a counterattack, but suffered heavy losses, including 69 tanks, and retreated back into their lines. The Germans struck back and were repelled by the first line of defenses. All the while, the air forces of both sides fought for supremacy in the sky. Over the next few days, the Germans pushed through the front lines of the northern defenses, focusing their efforts on recapturing the towns of Ponri and Okhavatka. By July 10th, they had taken Ponri, but they were still struggling to capture Okhavatka, which was situated on a hill and had a clear view of the front line. Russian reserve units were pulled up from behind Kars to reinforce this area, and the Soviets were suffering heavy casualties defending it. The German forces in the north had more or less been stalled, but on the south face of the salient, the situation was tense. The Soviets had launched another counteroffensive, which ended in a complete failure, and 50 of their tanks were lost to the Luftwaffe. They had committed almost all of their reserves and were still struggling to fend off the attackers. The tactic the Germans were employing was known as Panzerkiel, or tank wedge, with heavy tanks in the front, medium Panther tanks on the sides, and the weaker Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks in the center. The Germans were steadily gaining ground in the south, and sent several hundred tanks to secure the vital city of Prokhorovka. This city would be crucial for encircling the rest of Kursk, and it was well defended. The Soviets had moved many of their forces to the city, as well as whatever reserves they could muster up in the area. On July the 12th, the Germans sent hundreds of airplanes swarming the Soviet positions around Prokhorovka and bombing them relentlessly. In return, the Soviets bombarded the German lines with artillery strikes. Just as the artillery began to quiet down, the tank forces of both sides emerged from their positions headed on a collision course with each other. The German tanks engaged in the battle were from three main groups, SS Totenkopf on the left flank, SS Liebstandarte in the center, and SS Das Reich protecting the right flank. Overall, the Germans had about 300 tanks for the battle, and the Soviets had more than 600. As the hordes of tanks smashed into each other, all hell broke loose. In the chaos that followed, thick dust from all the explosions and the close proximity of friend and foe made it difficult for either side to provide air or artillery support. Soviet formations were far less coordinated, but numerically superior, and introduced some interesting tactics, such as speeding up close to the enemy, or according to some sources, even ramming directly into the German tanks. The Germans were also horrified to discover that at such close range, the Soviet tank shells could penetrate their armor. To the Soviets, a damaged tank meant it could likely be repaired later, but for the Germans, this deep into enemy territory, a damaged Tiger was a permanently lost Tiger. The battle raged on throughout the day, with no side making a clear victory. Several times it seemed that the Germans were on the verge of breaking through the Soviet formations, but each time the line held strong. 
At one point, two Soviet tank brigades broke through the front line and were close to reaching the German communication lines. While they were being held off, four German Tigers positioned themselves to defend the breach left flank of the Liebestarte group and stubbornly held their ground. After defeating the Soviet 181st Tank Brigade with no casualties, the four Tigers engaged the 31st and 32nd Tank Brigades. Finally, the 170th Brigade, after losing its commander and several tanks, managed to push the Tigers back and gain some ground, but were eventually pushed back to their original position. As the sun set, both sides were exhausted and German forces retreated. In just one day of fighting, the Germans had lost 60 to 80 tanks and the Soviets had lost up to 400, some of which could be repaired and some of which were now nothing more than a heap of scrap metal. Even though it may have seemed like the Germans had dealt a heavy punch to the Soviet Union in terms of numbers, they still weren't able to gain any ground, meaning it was an operational failure. The numerically superior Soviets quickly replaced their losses, but the Germans were simply running out of steam. On July 13, 1943, Hitler ordered the end of Operation Citadel. He was losing his best panzer divisions and his most experienced men around Kursk, and he couldn't afford such losses because on July 9, just a few days into Operation Citadel, the Allies invaded Sicily. The war was turning into something Hitler had done everything he could to avoid a fight on two fronts. And with Italy's support for the cause diminishing, he needed to send some troops of his own down to help defend southern Europe. So he ordered his men to hold the grounds that they had taken near Kursk and adopt a defensive strategy. This was playing right into the Soviets' hands, who had hoped to destroy large numbers of German armor before moving on their own offensive, and they wasted absolutely no time in doing so. Beginning on July the 12th, the Soviets launched Operation Kutuzov in the north. Soviet spearheaded attacks penetrated deeply into the German lines, threatening to encircle them. They now had the Germans on a desperate, spiraling retreat, and although the Soviets were suffering heavy losses, they managed to replace them, as always. This operation gave the Soviets momentum in the north and paved the way for the liberation of more Russian cities in the coming weeks. In the south, the Soviets launched Operation Rumyantsev. After two weeks of diversion attacks, the main Soviet spearheads attacked on August the 3rd, quickly pushing deep into German lines and taking territory. In just two days, they liberated the city of Belgorod once again, allowing them to focus their efforts on liberating Kharkov, which they achieved just three weeks later. Overall, Operation Citadel had been a massive failure. For the first time, a German advance had failed to make a major breakthrough, and it had drained the German army of fuel, vehicles, and men. Including both Operation Citadel and the immediate Soviet counteroffensive, the Germans had lost over 160,000 men and more than 750 tanks. While more than 250,000 Soviets were killed in the fighting, more than 600,000 were wounded or sick, and at least 6,000 Soviet tanks were destroyed. Now, losses should always be taken with a grain of salt, as numbers can vary wildly depending on the source. Lots of German records were scattered or lost after the war, and the Soviets, of course, downplayed their losses and exaggerated their victories, as any army tends to do. It's also hard to gauge exactly how many tanks were lost, as a tank can be immobilized and considered destroyed, but if it's easily repairable, it can be back up and running shortly thereafter. But exact numbers aside, one thing was made clear from the Battle of Kursk. The end of the Third Reich was near. The Soviets could sustain heavy losses in every battle compared to the Germans, but their high production rates meant that anything was easily replaced. For example, during the Kutuzov operation in the north, the Soviets started with 2,308 self-propelled guns and lost 2,349 which is more than they started with. Not to mention the USSR had a seemingly unending supply of fresh recruits, pulling in more conscripts from all over the country. General Guderian, who earlier argued against an offensive at Kursk, knew that the tide in the war was shifting. After Operation Citadel was called off, he said, There were to be no more periods of quiet on the Eastern Front. From now on, the enemy was in undisputed possession of the initiative. Hitler, growing more and more frustrated about the state of the war, blamed his generals for the failures at Kursk, even though his determination to go through with the offensive after postponing it for months is largely to blame. As the war progressed, he made more and more military decisions, trusting his generals less and less, while Stalin did the exact opposite, putting his generals in full command over their respective areas and opting to trust their judgment instead of micromanaging every detail. After the Battle of Kursk, the Germans never again launched a major offensive in the Eastern Front. Instead, they tried desperately to hold on to the territory they had gained, while the Soviet Union relentlessly marched westward. Kursk was Hitler's last chance at defeating the Soviet Union, 
and he had completely failed. So we briefly mentioned the Allied invasion of Sicily in today's video, among a few others, but if you want to watch another War of Graphics video right now, the Allied invasion of Sicily is linked on the screen, and thanks for watching. Thank you.